Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here for our church family meeting this afternoon. Looks like we've got a good crowd. So why do we have these church family meetings? Um, you know, communication comes in all forms, shapes, sizes, avenues, channels, etc. And it's great as long as you're getting your communication through one of those avenues, channels, etc. So one of the things we want to do is, one, make sure that you have the opportunity to hear about what's going on at Chapel Street and hear about the plans at Chapel Street. But the other part of communication is that feedback loop, that conversation part of communication where you get to ask questions to get clarification or make sure that we're covering the topics that are of most interest to you. And that's why we have the church family meetings because as much as we want to communicate plans and activities and thoughts, etc., it's just as important for us to hear back from you. Make sure that we're hearing uh, your concerns, getting your questions, etc. So before we even start, start thinking about your questions. What do you want to ask uh, today? Things that we can help provide clarification and make sure that we're all aligned on what we're doing. Okay? All right. Well, let's open up in prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for all that you do for us. Well, you're a wonderful God. And we just uh, appreciate so much the church that you've given us here. And we especially want to just take this time to make sure that we're doing what you want us to do. Uh, we ask that you bless our time here today. Uh, just give us the minds to hear. Uh, let us uh, hear your wisdom in our conversation. We just ask that you'll bless this meeting ultimately for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Jeff. Ken, and thanks to all of you for coming uh, here. I know it really does mean a lot to us, to me particularly, that you, that you took time to show up. I know many people... My assumption is for a lot of our families, they go to church, they trust, they like it, but they're not coming to meetings, which is fine. So thank you for showing up and caring enough to be here. Um, we did a series of these meetings. You might remember the last time we did these kind of meetings outside of the annual meeting was during the transition between Pastor Brian and me over, over three years ago. We had a number of meetings. They involved primarily the succession plan and transition between Pastor Brian and myself, but also they involved talking about what began to emerge with the Mill Creek campus when we were first exploring that possibility. I really enjoyed the spirit of those meetings because we were able to share with you what we knew, what we decided, and what we were still praying about and discussing and the things that we didn't know as well. There's no, uh, just in case you're wondering, there's no uh, special information you're gonna get today, there's no crisis, there's no problem, there's no big thing. But I just thought it's, maybe it's time for us to do that again, to talk about where we think God is taking us as a, as a church, what that might mean, what we've decided, what we're discussing, let you speak into that and hear and, and process that together. So to start, I just want to ha have you hear from two people briefly who are really answers to prayer for many of you and certainly for me. Uh, they are our new uh, executive team, Pastor John Bechtel and Abe Doncel. Is Doug here? Did Doug make it to the meeting? You still came to the meeting. How about that? Let's have a round for Doug. <laughs> Doug. Yeah. Who? who comes to meetings when he doesn't have to leave them, I thought that, I thought that you'd be like, you know, gone forever. We're thrilled. So uh, <laughs> I'd like to bring up John Bechtel to give you just a, a brief glimpse of kind of, he's been here a little over two months now, and some of his perspective on, from being on our staff. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jeff. You know, it actually is uh, two months to the day uh, that I started here at Chapel Street. And I just want to say, on behalf of my family, I, I just want to thank uh, the Chapel Street family for the way that you have welcomed us uh, so warmly. Uh, you have cared for us, and we definitely have experienced the love of Jesus through, uh, through this community already. And so we're grateful we're here. So I've been here for two months, so that's a short amount of time. Um, but it's, it's, it's also enough time for me to make some initial observations. So what I thought I would do is share six initial observations I've had, and then with those observations, maybe I'll give, you, give you some clarification and maybe some crystallization of what my role is, because my role is new here at Chapel Street. So again, I want to give six quick observations. Uh, first one, observation number one is we are healthy. We are healthy here at this church. Uh, we are healthy spiritually. We are healthy culturally. We are healthy financially. Uh, I am not here to, to fix anything. I am here to, to, to build it on the, on the faithfulness of people um, and to stand on the shoulders of faithful generations and to help, help, our, uh, help improve through structures and systems, uh, things that we do and the way we do things. So again, I just want to start by saying that this is a healthy place. And don't take that for granted. Uh, a lot of places can't say that. 
And again, I am grateful for all of your faithfulness in, in making this such a healthy place. The second observation is we are on mission. You know, as I've been working with the staff, I see it daily that we are tangibly living out our mission to experience grace, to grow in faith, and to make an impact. So what am I here for? I'm here to support uh, Pastor Jeff and the staff in, in developing and maintaining our mission momentum so we can more effectively all be for where we are. Observation number three, we have a gifted staff team. And I can't say that strongly enough. We have a gifted staff team. Two of my values for our staff is that they would uh, be programming with excellence. And I think we saw that yesterday with S'mores and More, where we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people show up. And it was an opportunity for us to be, to be good neighbors and, and for people to be introduced to Chapel Street, but ultimately to be introduced to Jesus. So we, we, um, we program with excellence, but I also, uh, care deeply that our staff are pastoring, that they are being ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people they are serving. And, and that, that is happening in real and tangible ways. You know, for the last six weeks, my wife and I have been part of a Rooted community. And Rooted is, is a discipleship curriculum that, that hopefully all of you will have the opportunity to go through in the near future. It's, it's really a great way to, to get back to the basics of what um, our Christian faith is about. And this past week, there, this question was asked in our little small group of 12 folks. Who do you know that reflects the love of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, in the way they are living their life? And, and, and in our little group of 12 folks, four uh, staff names came up in particular. Becky Chenault, Jamie Valentini, Lorreen Coffey, and Aaron Wise. And if our little group of 12 people have had four staff members impact them deeply, I can't imagine how deeply our staff are impacting across the board. So I'm not here to uh, uh, improve the staff. I'm here to help develop the staff and encourage them to continue to fan and inflame the gifts they've been given. Observation number four, we are in the midst of a lot of change. Um, in the last three years, we've had a change at the leadership level. We've had a new, uh, new uh, multi-site uh, space that's been built. We've had a name change. Uh, you know, this year we've had uh, some, some big changes uh, in the staffing, uh, we just heard. And, and also, we're, um, we had an office change, even where there was some space that was moved around. There's, there's a bunch of change that is happening. Um, what am I here, here to help with change? I'm just here to help the staff navigate and embrace this change. It can be a, a challenge to do that. Um, but one of the things I want to encourage you about is in the midst of all this change, in my, my two months here, it's very clear that we're not changing who we are. Maybe the way we're doing things, maybe the way we're trying to reach people, but we're, we're staying the course. So we're in the midst of much change. Uh, observation number five, we must grow. You know, there's the old adage, either you grow or you die. Where there's growth, there's life. And this is something that, that we need to be doing uh, as a church. And I think that we are doing. One of my favorite ways to describe the ministry of the church is singing the new song about the old, old story. Singing a new song about the old, old story. You know, we need to find new ways to stay faithful. And that's something that I, I've seen that we have, been, we have been doing. We have been uh, seeking new ways to reach uh, Kane County for Jesus. Um, and we've been, we've been trying to stay faithful. I've even seen that even with Dr. Yuan coming. We're trying to stay the course for what God teaches in his word. So I'm just here to help the staff implement new and faithful ways uh, to reach our ever-changing world. And then finally, observation number six, we must be developing next generation leaders. Uh, this, this started with Paul when he told Timothy to entrust gospel ministry to, to younger people who can teach. And we need to be about that. And really our multi-site vision rests on the ability to do this. So the, the final uh, way that I, I see myself helping is, uh, is helping us develop new leadership development pathways for, uh, for the next generation leaders. That's gonna be something that's mission critical to what we do. So uh, Chapel Street, we're healthy. We're, we are healthy and we are on mission. I really wanna encourage, encourage you about that. We have an incredibly gifted staff. Um, and so in the midst of much change, we're gonna be able to continue to grow. And uh, one of the ways we're gonna do that is through developing next generation leaders. So that's, that's uh, my observations. And just to recap, uh, kind of give you some pictures of what it is that I do. One of the ways I like to describe it is I'm just an old offensive guard. So, so my job is to keep the quarterback clean 
and then to help our directors the receivers score touchdowns so the owner can get the glory and get the credit. And so that's, that's part of who I am. And another way I like to, to talk about is in terms of a servant, uh, in terms of kingdom, I'm here to serve the servants who serve you so that the people of Chapel Street can serve the world. And uh, that's, uh, that's what I hope I do. It's been a great uh, two months. I look forward to uh, two years, uh, two decades uh, serving with you. And uh, let's see what the Lord, we can do with the Lord together. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. I was a defensive lineman, so I was the guy that John was holding in those days. So. <laughs> um, I, I, I am so thankful that God has brought John and his family to us. Uh, in fact, some of you maybe haven't had a chance to meet them yet, but I'm going to embarrass Layla and Emma and Bangelin. Bangelin, would you stand up and wave? Come on, say hi. John's done. <laughs> Get a chance to get to know them. Um, I think our staff is already growing under John's leadership, and uh, if you're wondering, if you're newer, like what specifically um, John referenced this, helping the staff, prior to John's arrival, um, kind of a holdover from a church we used to be, I had nine direct reports, and those that were reporting to me could tell you that was more than I could manage uh, in terms of the number of people, what they need to really flourish in their role, and that's a big part of the reason we brought John on, and he's doing just a fantastic job, and and um, looking forward to that. So the next person I want you to hear from is, is Abe. And Abe's stepping into an existing role, the director of operations. Uh, you've been accustomed to Doug's voice and his, his quirkiness. No, only kidding. But his, uh, his thoroughness and integrity, and, uh, and, and we've been praying about who that person would be. And I remember vividly when Eric Harris decided, you know, he'd had enough of us uh, and decided to step down. And we were praying about who that would be, and it was Doug. And we've been doing the same thing. And God and his faithfulness has brought us the person I think is the perfect one to lead us into the future. So I want to just bring up Abe, let him give you a few insights from much less than two months, but let's welcome Abe. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Jeff, and uh, good afternoon. Um, as Jeff said, my name is Abe Dotsell, and I'm a uh, much less shorter tenure than uh, John. I've been back and on roll about 10 days, so I don't have six insights yet. I'm working on one or two at the moment. Um, but for us, uh, for me and my family, it was a little bit like coming home. We actually were part of Chapel Street. We were members and attendees here for over a decade, uh, up until last summer, where uh, I'd spent about 25 years in corporate America in uh, different roles, and uh, God had uh, changed and moved us, and we took a role out in California. So we moved uh, from, from here out to, to California just last August, and uh, God in his providence, uh, after a short time out there, um, made clear to us that uh, it was uh, time for another change, and uh, just last week, all of our stuff arrived back from California, and we are uh, moved back here and thrilled to be uh, moving into this role as the as the executive director of operations. Jeff st stole a little bit of my thunder uh, in regards, so I wanted to personally and publicly thank Doug um, for his service to this to this body, his stewardship of, of that role. It, it is uh, a huge uh, responsibility to follow in, in his footsteps and, in, and Eric before that. But I wanted to thank Doug just for his service there. Even, uh, even in my short 10 days here, he's been a huge resource. Uh, I've made clear to him that while he's left the job, he's not left the area, and I know exactly where both of his houses are, and so I will uh, make sure to find him whenever I need him, but it's been, uh, it's been a blessing, and, and I'm honored to be able to, to help fill in that role as, as, the, um, as a steward of helping this, this body and this congregation and, and this church move forward where God's calling us. I think as I've come back, and, and while we were away for a, a year, I, I, we stayed connected. I was, you know, we were watching services online. We still had plenty of friends back here that we stayed connected to. And it was neat to see from a distance, while we'd been close uh, before that, to see from a distance what God was doing here. And I think just in the short time coming back, uh, I think one of the, the biggest things that's really has just um, resonated with me and it spoke to me is just the amazing faithfulness of how God has blessed this body and what God is doing here in Chapel Street Church. We, we uh, as part of our move to California, obviously we're doing the typical church hunting uh, phase and, and uh, went to five or ten different churches over the course of the first few months. We were there trying to find a new first home, a uh, new church home rather, and, and each time we walked out of some, some great churches and some really um, you know exciting places, we walked out and, and one form or another said, yeah, it was good, but it wasn't Chapel Street, and, and it's not, wasn't quite the same, and I think it was uh, uh, neat to just see what a special place and kind of have a, a different even appreciation for what God is doing here and for his, his faithfulness and, and, and what's been taking place here. The other thing that I've noticed as I've gotten kind of now behind the curtain a little bit in the role and I had a chance to kind of get more um, involved in stuff, as John just alluded to, 
is to really have an appreciation for where we are and the foundation that we're building off of. Just the healthiness of our church, both spiritually, but also financially and, and, and systems-wise. We, we are in a, in a great place. And that speaks, again, to, to Doug and to, and to Eric before him and the staff. Just the foundation that is laid here that we can now grow off of. And as I look at my role and, and what I am and called to do here is really just to continue to be a steward of that and to build on the systems, to build on the processes that allow us to, to go where God is taking us. It's, it's exciting to see what's done just in the three campuses we have now, but as we look at where we believe God's called us to be a family of neighborhood churches, to work with our staff, to work with our team, to really figure out how do we do the things now to put us in a position to be able to faithfully and effectively, and as good stewards of what he's blessed us with, uh, be prepared to move forward wherever he, that he's taking us. So. I'm thrilled by that, to see the generosity of, of this body, to see uh, the gifts that are being used, both financially, but also in time and effort. Just even last night with the S'mores and More campaign or, or event, to see the, the, the volunteerism and the support that was given there just to put on something of that nature that has an impact and, and begins to share the love of, of God to those in our community. So it's an exciting time to be a part of that. And I'm looking forward to being a part of where we go from here as well and, and to faithfully follow up on on, on the stewardship of those who've come before. One last thing I like to do, and I think we do have a slide, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is I get the privilege of sharing, I thought I'd do a quick financial update, where I know Doug shared at length at our recent um, uh, annual meeting, but uh, given that we've got folks here, I wanted to make sure you're aware of where we're at currently. This is only six weeks into our new fiscal year, so there's a, not a lot of time behind us, but I think a, a great story to tell that's built on uh, previous years and uh, year and years of, of generosity and of just positive financial story. So if you look at our, this is through the six weeks ending October 6th, you see that our revenues are already $56,000 ahead of our 2019-2020 budget. So just a great pouring out of, of generosity and, and of, of just uh, financial stability for for us. We're, our expenses are actually running a little bit lower, so that's a good position to be in. Due, some of that's just due to staff changes and some other things, but I think it's also due to a determined diligence by our staff, again, and by the team to really be thoughtful of how we, we steward this, the gifts that are given to, to the church, how we use those funds in, in an effective way and, and make sure that we're doing that uh, with, uh, with a lot of prayer and consideration before we expend those funds. And so the fact that we're in this position, you can see, gives us currently a, a unrestricted uh, cash on hand of about 550000 which is just about one and a half months of our operating budget. And that's something we're looking at. We want to be faithful and understand that this funds that come in are used to advance ministry, and we want to use those funds effectively. But we also want to make sure that we're being fiscally responsible and that we're uh, providing for and creating that, that security as a church that we have that should something, uh, should a need arise, should there be uh, the need to, to address some issues that we've got funds to do that. So we'll be working with the staff and the team to continue to understand as long as our finance committee, how do we balance it and, and, mit it and use those funds effectively and make sure that we also have the funds on hand that we need uh, should, the, should that need arise. And I think also of interest, as you look at our, just our overall attendance, um, again, if you look at the last 12 months, we're up about 3% in attendance, which may not seem uh, like a huge amount, but as you think of as our number grows, that percentage becomes a bigger and bigger absolute number. So as we've seen the growth just overall in our, in our body and across the three campuses, a 3% growth on what's already a growing, you know, as that pie gets bigger, each individual piece of that pie is more significant. And so we're, we're thrilled for the folks that God has brought to us and we continue to trust uh, that uh, we'll continue to reach out to those in this can in the area as well. So I'm thrilled to be back home as it were. My family and I are thrilled to be back home and we're still living amongst boxes and figuring out where stuff goes, but we're excited to be part of uh, this, this church body and this family and where God's taken us. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Abe. Uh, thank you, Abe. Um, you, the the, the uh, attendance numbers, I just listened to a, a, wor a webinar about worship attendance that uh, across the nation, in larger churches and smaller churches, people are attending less frequently. There are uh, those who used to say they were regular attenders would identify as three times a month or more, and now it's two times a month or less and, and declining. So actually, any increase in attendance, this webinar guy was saying, is, 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 uh, is exponential growth in size because people just aren't showing up as often. Even a flat attendance can show growth because people aren't showing up as often. So it's just trying to figure out like how do we track more effectively who we are engaging with. Um, it, 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 is an all, it is an only weekend attendance. So it's great to see those numbers even if they, uh, yeah. what's that? Oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, Abe's family. 
the, those of them that are here, where are they? Where's Heidi? And, jo- and Josh. Heidi and Josh, would you stand and everybody can say hi to you? I know you love that. <laughs> Josh is never going to forgive me. <laughs> We're thrilled to have them back, and, and even though their other two children are somewhat launching into adulthood. Right? Yeah, good. Okay, I want to talk to you about a couple of things that are, 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 are happening and coming up and that are in our hearts and minds as leaders, let you hear about them, uh, kind of first blush, and then and see where that takes us. But, but to do that, I want to go back to our vision. Uh, you'll see this image here on the screen of our vision statement. Uh, we've had different iterations of this. Can we pull that up? Do we have it? The slide there it is, yeah. We're a family of neighborhood churches. Now, that, that first phrase is important. A family of neighborhood churches. Uh, not, not a federation of, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not separate independent churches. There's a family, so we share some DNA. Families share DNA. We share some uh, personality and, and we share some, we're, we're tight, something holds us together, our family ties, as it were, of neighborhood churches. Neighborhood matters. We're not trying to uh, launch campuses all over the Chicagoland area or all over the Midwest. We have a neighborhood. And you might remember back to our neighborhood impact campaign. We drew that box on the map on the, the screen. It was about, if you think, route. 47 in the west, Route 59 in the east, Route 20 in the north, Route 30 in the south, roughly. That's our neighborhood as a church, slightly larger than Kane County. You get the idea. 650,000 people living in that corridor. Less than 300,000 of them say they have a church home. There's plenty of work to do in our neighborhood. Uh, So when we think about what's the best way for us to make the most significant impact for the gospel, where God's placed us in our neighborhood as a church, you have a neighborhood as a family, I have one, but we have one as a church as well. We determined, and you've been a part of this, that we, it's not to build a bigger and bigger box at one campus in hopes that people drive from farther and farther away to attend the big show. It's to reproduce ourselves. And that came to us in the first opportunity, really, with Mill Creek. Because Abe mentioned we're three campuses. If we're honest, we're two and a half campuses. This campus and Kesslinger campus function like a hybrid. We're a mile away. Nobody plants a campus for multiplication purposes a mile away. That makes no sense. We would not do that. But this is, but I don't know, we won't go through the whole story again, but God gave us these two campuses and they're flourishing and doing well and so we have them. But the third one, Mill Creek, came to us in a different capacity and that's what made us think about, let's become a family of neighborhood churches. And each one, a place where people can experience grace, grow in faith and make an impact for where they are. So anyway, that's where we're headed. We do not believe that should stop with Mill Creek. We're not done, in other words. Uh, Listen to a podcast on on multi-site, what's happening in the multi-site movement in the the country. More than 65% of churches who decide to go multi-site for vision reasons to make the greatest impact for the gospel stop at two or three campuses. Do you know the reason? The reason is they are not able, they, they, they are not, the infrastructure, the systems, and infrastructure and strength of the organization can't sustain more than that. And so they sort of bog down. They can't reproduce. This is precisely why why I wanted you to hear from Abe and John. The last two and a half years in our church, we were changing on the outside. Name, merger, campus launch, very new leader in in the lead seat. So there was some external changes that were exciting, challenging, but exciting. Right now, we're in a season, this year, and I think another year probably or so, of changing on the inside. Not changing our identity, who we are, but structurally. Staff organization, strengthening of our systems, strengthening of the way we are aligned as staff, for, for one central reason. So we can go back to that slide of the mission, if you would, the vision. So we can do that. So we can do that. So we can reproduce for the sake of the gospel. Uh, I just got an email from Pastor Sterling and Allie Goble, the worship leader at Mill Creek, last week saying, we've got to start thinking about Christmas Eve service time, she said. And she said, we've been looking at the numbers. We, they, we had 800 people at Christmas, at Mill Creek alone, Christmas, last year, Christmas Eve. We think we need to add a service. Just a little moment, I sitting at my desk, read that email of rejoicing and praising God. It wasn't that long ago we were meeting, Doug remembers this, with the Mill Creek, Faith Baptist and Mill Creek team, wondering if this could even work. And now they had 800 people at Christmas Eve services and thinking about adding a service. I want to see God do that again, don't you? I want to see that happen again. More people who don't know Jesus have an opportunity to come and experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact. That's what we're here for. And so we don't want to take our eye off the ball. So I want to talk to you, first of all, all that to set up. Maybe you're wondering, maybe you're not, but I want to talk to you about what about the fourth campus? Or 3.5, if we're keeping the math right, right? 
What about our next campus? Where are we with that? How many of you have wondered that? We're launching next week. Surprise! No, only kidding. <laughs> only kidding. I hope you heard me say we are praying fervently and preparing and we intend to, to someday launch a fourth campus. Let me say equally clearly, we do not have a facility or location picked. We have no down payment, no contract, no, no we have some idea, but no thoughts yet on where that is. No, no clear direction yet on where that is going to be. We have some options we're exploring. So, and nor do we have a timeline. Nor do we know it's gonna be next month. We, we sp- this was the primary um, issue we prayed about and discussed at our executive council retreat back in May. And our best pray and thinking then told us we think we're two years plus away from being ready. And that was six, seven months ago. So um, at, at, at the earliest, studies will tell you the hardest thing to find is the location, the right location, where it's not an albatross of debt, a financial burden that we shouldn't take on right now, where it's, in a, it's in a, actually in a neighborhood, you know, where it has some proximity to families and homes and schools and that kind of thing, life of the community. That's the hardest thing to find. The most important thing to find is the leader. We think we're in the process of developing who those leaders will be, the team that will go, but we do not yet know where that will be. So I really, I mean this with all my heart, I ask you to pray. I ask you to pray that God would make that clear to us, that he'd direct us where that's going to be. We don't know. Maybe it will be another church that comes to us and says what Mill Creek said, would you take us over for the sake of the gospel? Maybe that's a good thing that we would say yes to. Maybe we rent a facility. Maybe we build one. All these things have to be vetted with the, 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 the very real bur- financial burdens that they might bring, the proximity to where we want to be. And so I, we don't know yet, but that doesn't, I, I want to move the ball forward in this next year. It won't happen if it just stays words on a screen that we occasionally talk about. It happens by prayer and by effort to prepare ourselves to do that. So anyway, uh, I'm going to pause there and let you ask questions about the fourth campus if you have them, where we are with them. I don't know if that's clear enough, um, but anybody have questions about specifically multi-site strategy, fourth campus readiness, anything you want to ask is fair game. And I know it can be intimidating to ask in a room this size, but somebody's brave. Uh, My name is Tom Dagenhart. My question is, is it better to expand into a multi-campus organization or is it better to do a rehab or build and then spin off. Can you explain, Tom, the difference between rehab and build and spin off? Well, as far as, uh, as in the case of, of Mill Creek, we took on a, oh. at that point, a failing church, as I understand it. Uh, we put a lot of effort, a lot of money into it, a lot of leadership. It's now a, uh, uh, an organization which is expanding, and to be quite honest, I, uh, through the internet, I listen to their uh, sermons. I'm very impressed with what I'm hearing. Uh, but years ago, uh, before I became a member here, there was a church which was sponsored uh, by this uh, then First Baptist, who was then made uh, independent. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know the details of it. Uh, My question is, is it better to uh, spawn a uh, a facility and then equip it and then uh, cut it loose? Or is it better to try to have an umbrella? That's well articulated. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom, for those of you who don't know, is referring to um, Valley Brook Community Church, a church that we planted more than a decade ago. I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe. Um, And so... uh, I don't have a lot of information about how they're doing at the moment, but that's, I think, what you were referring to. The two different models. One is a church plant where it it becomes quickly an independent church with no financial or leadership ties to us. The other is the multi-site strategy, which is, you mentioned that. Um, We think it's better to pursue the multi-site strategy. Let me tell you why. Not that church plants are bad. They can be very effective. But um, one of the things that Valley Brook struggled with is how quickly they were independent and then you don't have the infrastructure and resources. What makes a church multi-site effective is not whether the preaching's on a screen or, or, or live, it's whether, whether or not it's centrally governed and led. So if you ask the average person, I've shared this before, 
If you ask the average person if they want a church of 2,000 or 200, what would most of you say? But most of you say 200 probably, right? No people. It's big enough to do some stuff, but people would know me. But if I ask you, what would you like that church to provide and do in the community? You will start describing things that only a 2,000 person church can do. We think the multi-site strategy can, if we do it well, give us the best of both worlds. Give us the strength, vitality, resources, energy, and synergy, and movement of a 2,000 or more person church, which we're larger than that now, and the community and connection and neighborhood feel of a 200 person church, which is Mill Creek is larger than that now. So uh, that's, that's why we're doing it this way. Um, how long those things stay connected to us, what decisions get made at the local level and the central level, what resources get shared and what things are independent, that all needs to be worked out as we go and as we grow as an organization. I can tell you right now, and Doug can attest to this and Abe, that Mill Creek is already financially an independent institution. They, they do depend on us for communications and, and, and payroll and, and, and central services, as we call it, but they're their giving is supporting themselves and more so. So that's a really healthy thing. Does that answer your question? We wanna go multi-site, we think it's stronger and more effective for the long haul rather than plant independent churches. But good question. Somebody else has a one. Hi, I'm Sandy Polinsky. We are at Mill Creek. We are part of the core team and one of- You are the core team, Sandy. <laughs> So that's where my question comes from, mm -hmm. is we are adding a multiplier, as we did with Mill Creek, mm -hmm. and we are not yet replicating any of the ministries at that campus. So all we're doing is adding to the attendance of already heavily attended ministries, like Adventure Club, Club 56, mm -hmm. couples mm -hmm. events, things like that. They're selling out, we're losing spots even faster. Yep. When are we going to start seeing these ministries then replicated at these multi-site campuses instead of always going to a main campus. Right, that is a really, really insightful question and one that all multi-site churches wrestle with. Most churches that do multi-site have a main campus or ascending campus, a mothership, if you will, where most of the midweek stuff happens. Uh, and that's, that's good and not so good in some ways. One of the, some of the not so good is what you're referring to. We're wrestling through as a staff right now which ministries we should reproduce, use the word replicate, same thing, which ones we should represent, and which ones we don't need to. I don't think that everything that we're currently doing has to be reproduced at every site. I don't think it can be, quite frankly, nor should it be. We know that to, for a church to be healthy and thriving on day one, it needs to have relevant Bible teaching, vibrant worship, quality children's ministries, and, and group life. Like, and, and people, so those four things need to be in place. Beyond that, I don't know that we have to have any of those things replicated. Because of the proximity, we're sharing a lot of those things now. But you're putting your finger on a, a kind of a vision question we're struggling through right now. What's it going to look like in the future? Will there be moms together at every site? Will there be team at every site? Or will some of these things just, we won't necessarily reproduce and that's okay. Because there are lots of churches that don't have those things and they're still thriving for the gospel. But your specific question was, when will we see those reproduced? I don't know that I can tell you when or if some of them, but we're, we are discussing that as a staff. Is that, is that fair? Anything to add to that, John, or anybody? Yes, Galen. Abe, you're going to get in good shape, running up and down. Oh, Heather, Heather, Heather first. Um, so I'm wondering if we have an idea yet for a fourth campus, if it's going to be similar in culture to Mill Creek, are we looking at a different type of culture? Is it going to yeah. be more simulcast heavy? And how are we preserving our culture in that? Great, great question. So when you say culture, do you mean lo uh, cultural location, demographic of who we're reaching? Or do you mean the feel of the service the itself? The feel of the service. Because they'll, they'll be connected and tied to each other. Um, we said from the outset, we believe in, in, the, in predominantly live preaching. And that isn't changing. I, I would not be here if Brian had decided to go video venue. I would have probably left to find other opportunities because that was a gift that I had and wanted to grow in. And so we want to continue to do that. We want to be a place that, continue. but now, having said that, we also know we have to be able to do video preaching really well when we need to. So while um, the multi-site movement in the nation, it's still over 60% that do video teaching primarily. It's shifting a bit. I guess I could tell you as far as the preaching goes for the culture, Heather, we would be Live preaching is the rule, and video teaching is the exception to that rule. The frequency, I think we have to hold loosely to find out what we need on, on that context. 
On the worship side, I think, and Ken, if Kenton were here, I mean, he may not be here. Oh, he's up there. Sorry. Hey, Ken. Ken and I, we've had so many conversations about this, haven't we? About it's way easier if we just all did the same style of worship. And lots of multi-site churches do this. We're all doing these songs this way, reproduce it everywhere else. We don't do that, which gives him headaches and, uh, and, and you know, less hair than he already has. But it's, I think it's healthier and better to let the worship be contextualized for that site. Meaning the worship leader, the campus pastor, there'll be some similarities, they'll be contemporary in style, but it's not mandated from one person and it's in one location. Allie took kind of her vibe and ethos with Sterling's temperament and the worship reflects them as it should on that campus. You can tell it's Chapel Street, but it's not exactly like Kesslinger, certainly not like, he will get to South Street in a minute, so Tom. The uh, uh, services from all three campuses are recorded on the internet. And if you go to our website where it says sermons, you will find a uh, directory or direction to go to, I think it's iTunes is one and I forgot what the other one is, but you can get the sermons for all three campuses and I enjoy every one of them. They're all different. I enjoy that you enjoy them. Uh, Galen, go ahead. So one of my, my question relates to um, looking back over the last two or three years where these changes have been made, can you identify a handful of major uh, surprises, problems, changes you had to make within the change as a leadership team and what you have done deal with it. I'm, I'm looking at it from an organizational perspective because I understand when you make these changes, you run into gotchas and, and issues as you move along. What were some of those issues? Hmm. And what have you done to change and address them and how does that affect looking forward? That's a great question. So let me repeat it if I got you right. You're saying the changes we have made, what challenges have we faced in that process? Correct. And what are we learning as we go forward? Doug, do you want to speak to this, some of the changes in, in operational departments at all? I mean, I, I can certainly from the, from the staff side, the structural side, but maybe some of those as well. I think Doug has said, I don't want to speak for him, uh, on the operational side, and by the way, what we mean by that is fi finances, facilities, information technology, communications, and human resources side, that uh, that's one of the most challenging places. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I would say that, and, and what I've... Uh, had discussions with Abe about in terms of opportunities for him to really take us to the next level is in the area of staffing. When you have three, even three campuses, as Jeff alluded to, it really changes the dynamic of your staffing model. And we've adapted in some ways, and in some ways we haven't. And we've got to come to grips with that. Um, and so we've, we've been challenged, quite frankly, and, and I've tried different things in some, on some of my, my areas of responsibility, and I've met with very mixed success. And some of the things that I'm most disappointed about in terms of my tenure here are, are some of those staffing challenges that I just I couldn't crack the nut, so to speak. So a Abe is, is gonna be well positioned to do that. And, but that's, that's a, it's a huge issue. Um, investing in your systems, you know, your infrastructure, your, 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 no organization will grow beyond its, the, its ability to be supported by its infrastructure. And so being the leader responsible for that infrastructure, I've seen that firsthand. So we, you've got to continue to invest in your systems and your processes. Mm -hmm. And we've done that, done that well, I think, but now to go to a fourth campus, wow. We got to we got to take that again to the next level. We uh, got to get a whole new church management system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's old, antiquated, legacy system. Doesn't work. Doesn't work well. We've got to make that investment. We have got a team of people looking at that right now. And we'll we'll make that investment. It's going to be fantastic when we do. But those are the kinds of things, Gail. I think uh, the staffing structure the infrastructure support from a systems and process standpoint yeah. that you struggle with. Because mm -hmm. you can't do it all at once. 
Let me, uh, let me add to that on the staffing side. So, so first of all, pray that Doug's struggles will be Abe's successes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but um, all, all kidding aside, um, on the staffing side, so uh, places where, like facilities, for example, Doug was alluding to this. Can you have a full-time staff or, or two at every campus? That becomes financially almost undoable. Are there other ways to, to, to tackle this and go at this on the facility side? As the facilities grow, the needs grow, it's a, it's, it's a massive undertaking. So that's one of the challenges that we're trying to address. What things do we contract out? What things do we do in-house? On the communication side, all the videos, which you, you all are blessed by. We, we, people from outside of our church see the videos that Peter, where's Peter? Where's Peter up there? Where is he? Heather was asking questions, so I know he's here somewhere. He's in the booth, actually. Uh, he's amazing. He's amazing. But he's one guy, and he's not even full-time. Um, and so we, we know we have to invest in that. On the social media communication side, the rate at which we're growing, Stetson and his team, uh, they can barely keep their arms around the communication needs that we have. And so we know we have to invest in that. But you start adding these things together, it's like, well, what's the rate at which we can add all these things and still grow and still pay down our debt and still be ready financially for a fourth campus? It's really challenging. That's not to mention on the ministry side. One of the challenges that's come up that we've seen is what Brian did with me should serve as a model for not just other churches, but our departments. We should all be thinking about succession planning. Every department head, every leader should be thinking about who's going to replace them, who are they developing to take over someday. Even if that person isn't on staff yet, we should all be thinking that way. So that's been a challenge for us. Um, I think Abe, or John mentioned it. We have to develop the next generation of leaders, not just in the pastoral residency program or the summer internship, but across our staff, we have to be more intentional and effective at identifying and developing leaders. And so these are some of the things that we, we knew and were tackling, but have become... If you're really gonna multiply, they become like mission critical things. We have to do these. We have to get better at them. And so we're working at it. Judy has a question. Oh, did somebody else have a hand up I missed? Oh. Hello, I'm Judy. This is uh, Joe's wife, by the way. This is our pastor resident's wife, Judy. Hello. Isn't she great? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe, yeah. I just wanna piggyback off of Heather's question about culture. I'm also yeah. wondering location wise, if you have yeah. any top ideas. She asked about location of the, the, of the fourth campus. Okay. We have had, I have had a half dozen conversations with churches that have approached us, with churches that we've approached, with, with, with uh, people that have talked to us about properties, and none of them have been right. And they've been all over the map. They've been north and west, like Elburn, Burlington area. They've been south and west, like uh, you know, Aurora, Oswego area. They've been east by West Chicago. None of them have been right for financial reasons, for culture reasons, for that's a money pit. We don't want to get involved in that. For people that are just weird, we don't want to be associated with them. Like, <laughs> this, it's been all over the map. And I, I, I'm so, so it's not like we're not trying, but God has not made it right yet. And I, we want to be, I really want to be pursuing this, but open handed, not forcing it. So the answer to your question is no, I don't know. I want to be open enough to go where He leads. It may be that God's timing is that when we identify the team, that the person that we identify to lead, um, and maybe the guy sitting next to you before you know it, is the person who has the vision and plan and, and, and location in mind. So right now, I don't know what that is. Jeff, can, can you share sort of the ideal scenario, 10 miles, that kind of thing? Thank you, Ken. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you can. You just said it. But um, we, we, we want to be further out than Mill Creek is from Kesslinger. Mill Creek is about an eight-minute, ten-minute drive from Kesslinger, and that's you know, we don't want to be any closer. We want to be like 15 minutes and beyond from our, the radius of our churches. So we're not um, competing uh, for, for people that will be driving back and forth. We want to be a, truly expand our reach. So if you drew a circle of, of 10 miles out from, from Kessling or kind of the center, we want to be in, outside of that radius. Uh, but again, we want to hold these things loosely because God brought to us something we never saw coming. So great question. Over here. Hi. Hey, Angie. Hi. I'm Angie Bateman. I was just curious if the model of what would happen with Mill Creek with Sterling and his worship cafe being the core group of people that went and opened that, yeah. are you looking to have that model again where a pastor and a group of people would have some time to generate a relationship before they opened up or even looking at a specific group? Yes, great, great question. So uh, if you don't know the story Andy's talking about, the Worship Cafe, which started long before we ever thought about a third campus, was a worship venue here on this campus, right down the hallway, which uh, now the Word and Table Service meets in there. 
And Pastor Sterling kind of was the host pastor for that, and that morphed into something, which unbeknownst to us, God was preparing a nucleus of people to go to Mill Creek. And so that, that was something that just God lined up. We learned from that, that an incubation period, where they are meeting together as a core team, worshiping together, casting vision together, is really healthy for the launch. So we would envision, uh, let, let's just say, and I, I get nervous about just saying, because I don't want you to walk out of here thinking, he said, I'm just saying, I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Right, you get the difference? Let's just say that God should bring to us a campus, uh, I don't know, Oswego or West Chicago or something. And it's the perfect situation. It's not a financial burden, we could accommodate it, and we could, maybe minor renovations, but we could, we could do that. We would not launch the next week. We would say, okay, let's back up, let's pick where we think we wanna launch, what time of year, and back up from there and build an incubation time where we, build, we call out to a core like we did with Mill Creek. And those core people, one of the key things about the effectiveness of a campus launch is you need critical mass. You need 75 to 100 or more people that are gonna go. And those people are not attenders, they're servants. They have to, like you are Angie, like, like you are Tony. Like many of them say, I'm going there and I'm gonna make this my campus and I'm gonna to serve to make it go. That's what takes time to build. So all that to say, absolutely that would be part of the plan when we have a site ready. We would have a long launch ramp up for that. In, in house, here. Uh, I don't mean here, maybe here, but on one of our campuses. Great question, oh, say over here? Do we have other hands? By going, say, as far as way, away as Oswego, not that it's all that far, but yeah. we, would that inhibit people from attending programs that would be at the mothership, so to speak, you know, those central yeah. yes. loca location programs, and how would we address that? Great question. This goes back to what Sandy, I think, was referencing, and, and depending on the location, it absolutely could. But I think we have to say that's okay. Remember, why are we doing this? Not so everybody can attend every program, but so people who are far from God or don't know him or are, are, are drifting would come to know the love of God in Christ. And the best way to do that, you know, you know that statistically speaking, churches are most effective at reaching people in the first five to seven years. And then you pretty much flatten out, unless you are reproducing yourself. So a single campus church that's been there for 50, 60, 70, 80 years and is not launching anything else has kind of hit its mark. It's flat. And you see that across the nation. So the reason we're doing this is the most effective way to reach people is to launch a new campus. New life, new initiatives. It gives life to that location, that campus, and to the launching entity as well. We've seen that at Kesslinger as well. Backfilling those empty seats. And, and so um, all that to say, Yes, I think there would be a real possibility that depending on where it is, they could not attend or wouldn't choose to attend some of the programs that are offered at the mothership. And quite frankly, that's okay. The programs are good, they're affecting lots of people, but the goal is preaching the gospel, vibrant worship, people in groups, serving children's ministry, that's... And then we'll see what needs to be reproduced. It, we may end up breaking team up someday and saying, we're gonna do that differently. Not in one location, but at different locations. I don't know. But I don't think we have to, we, what, what, the fact that we can't reproduce every sub-ministry shouldn't be a limiting factor on our ability to multiply as a church. That makes sense. Yeah. Who's next? With a microphone. Pete Berger. Pete, are you still playing golf? Is it too tomorrow, cold? Tomorrow, 841. <laughs> I'm just wondering where we're at with the debt that we took on from Mill Creek and the other campuses. There's only yeah. a couple months left. Yeah, we have about eight, eight months. So let me, let Doug or Abe, speak to that. He's referring to neighborhood impact debt and the Mill Creek mortgage debt. Yeah, uh, those two, uh, what was left over from the neighborhood impact campaign of 14 to 17 and the Mill Creek uh, mortgage that we assumed, about $533,000, were combined into a single mortgage, very favorable interest rate. We are steadily paying that down as part of our general fund budget. Uh, my recollection is it's around combined 830 maybe combined. Mm -hmm. So it's steadily coming down, yep. uh, and we make progress every month. We may send out another letter or video or some, or some encouragement to people that have remaining balances on their pledges to be faithful to finish that, finish strong because it matters. And, um, but we also have seen a number of unpledged 
uh, gifts trickle in on that. So it's a manageable amount of debt. I'd love to have it be zero in those eight months, but we'll, we'll trust God with that. So does that answer your question? Good. Thanks for asking it. Uh, let me shift gears away from the fourth campus to an, one more topic I wanted to discuss, uh, which may be of interest to you because it has to do with South Street Campus. Um, I'm, I'm running out of steam in my voice. I've been preaching all morning, so if, I, if, I, if you can't hear me, I'll try to project. But uh, we need to talk about this campus and what God's vision and future is for the maximum impact of this campus. Being actually less than a mile away from Kesslinger Campus uh, and being su- such an important resource for the operation of our whole uh, Chapel Street Church as a whole, what's the future of South Street Campus? How many of you have wondered that before? Anybody? Good. Let me tell you what's uh, not changing. We are absolutely 100%, it's important to hear me say this, committed to vibrant, excellent, traditional worship on this campus. That is not, in case there's still some latent leftover fear from back in the day, that is not going away. We're never changing that. We're committed to that. We've resourced that. In terms of staff dollars, this, this service gets an inordinate amount of resources, so that's not changing. We're committed to that. We want to do that really, really well. We want to see it grow. I will say, despite our efforts to try to get this campus to grow in attendance on the weekend, we've done physical changes to the campus, renovated the children's spaces, renovated different rooms, changed the kind of services with Word and Table and Worship Cafe. We haven't been able to move the needle a lot in that area. And part of that is, we just have to face, it's less than a mile away from our largest campus. That just is. It's not bad, it just is. It's okay. So what's the best use of this resource, some 42,000 square feet, right? I think 44,000 square feet that we own, and that's a beautiful building. What's the best use of it? I've already said one, vibrant, excellent, traditional worship, which is increasing rarity in this community. We need to market that and promote that and, and, and do that really well. Number two, this is the face of our compassion ministries for the whole of the Tri-Cities in King County called Shepherd's Heart. Aaron Wise is sitting right over here, the director of our Shepherd's Heart. And I, in case you are unclear about this, Shepherd's Heart is so much more than a food pantry. That's only, that's the part everyone knows. That's only a fraction of what they do. Underneath Bruce's leadership, Shepherd's Heart, Bruce leads all of that area, but Aaron has built this in, in her teams. They, they're doing budgeting teams. How many part of budgeting teams? Anybody here do budgeting teams? Yeah, some of you financial counseling for people, uh, counseling referrals, praying with people. They give out uh, um, quiet time or devotional bags, which is having great spiritual impact. There's recently we're partners with Administer Justice, which I can't even explain to you accurately all that means, but Aaron can if you want to. Uh, We're now a Administer Justice national location, right? Is that right? Um, And so the services that we are providing are well beyond coming and get some canned goods. Uh, the food pantry itself is pretty remarkable and unique in our community because of the dignity of the setting, the personal touch, and what we provide, the quality of what we provide for people. Um, it's not, if you're, it's, it's a mistake to think these people are all coming from Aurora and Elgin. Some, but some are right next door, right here. Some are in our own church family and some are from right around here. So we're committed to this. We thought, we know um, Shepherd's Heart, it wasn't that long ago, it was a closet upstairs here and Aaron wheeled a cart down the hall Weep, 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 fill up with bags, come back and give people a bag of groceries. And that was, that, that was a decade ago, less. And now it's a massive ministry, serving 1,100 people or more a month. You see them if you come by, line up the door. We're out of space. We're out of storage space, we're out of serving space, we're out of meeting space. And we have to address that. Or we're putting a, a lid on what we think God is trying to do. And we thought about months and months ago, well, let's look for something off-site. Let's look for a a facility to rent, a warehouse, a storefront. There's plenty of things. Erin and her team uh, have been adamant, and I've come to believe this with all my heart, that would be a huge mission mistake. If we take Shepherd's Heart off of any of our campuses, it becomes another food pantry. But because it's tied to not just any campus, but this campus, which is the third thing that it's on this campus, is our central services. The main hub of what Doug and now Abe lead our central services is housed right here our main office nerve center is here the fact that our compassion ministry is connected to the physical site where our nerve center is as an operation is really really healthy we interact with the clients all the time it gives it a whole different feel we do not want to lose that all that to say is we believe we need to address the space issues and capacity of shepherd's heart 
on this campus. Which means, drum roll, ready? We gotta get it out of the basement. We gotta get it upstairs. If we're serious about that, we, we, we can't address people coming up, people are clients, physically limitations, getting the stuff up to their cars. It's just not a good idea to have those stairs and this long hallway downstairs from the storage to the, where the shopping actually takes place. There's not space to meet down there and so we have to move it upstairs. You can see where this is going. What are the options upstairs, right? Where, what is the room we have? We are working with Aspen, the design build firm we've used for years, to help us design some plans that would involve some portion of the chapel and student center uh, to reconfigure that into Shepherd's Heart space. I realize for some of you this is the first time you're hearing this. I want you to hear me clearly. We do not have construction drawings. We do not have approval from a congregation to do this. We're not going forward with this yet. We're exploring the possibility of what that might look like how we could use that, what ministry space would we lose, how could we repurpose it. But I want you to hear me say as your pastor, I think this is critical. I think what this God has given us here is remarkable. Vibrant traditional worship, the nerve center of our whole operation for multiplication in the neighborhood church vision, and the face of our compassion ministry to the whole area. That's what South Street is, and it's pretty special. And I want to protect and, and, and bless and build both of those, all three of those things. But it will, it will likely mean some changes to the facility here. Now, if you're gonna ask about how much and when, I, I don't know any of that yet, we're working on that. We're working on that with, with Aspen and with the Executive Council, and anything that would involve massive reconstruction would require a congregational vote anyway, and so we'd have to come back to you with plans that you'd have to hear about. So, I'm giving you, maybe, maybe Ken's over there sweating under his jacket, like he's saying more than we plan to say, right? But I want you to know, that's what we're praying about. That's what we're thinking about. That's where we think this is going, so. I'm guessing there are questions. Jeff. Yeah. Oh, yes, thank you, Dave. We know, but that's important to say. I'm glad you brought that up. What it would mean is, um, whatever we decide to do on, uh, on this level, we would readdress the entire parking and drop-off out here. We would likely gain 30 to 40 spots right out there on that grassy knoll. We'd have a loading dock access. So some of our seniors don't have to walk in the freezing cold and wind like today from all the way around the, the, the lot. And, and, or, and we do have a much better access point for clients throughout the week and for worship on the weekends. But again, these are concepts, no plans and no, and no contracts right now. We don't normally refer to it as the grassy knoll. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. I have two questions. One is uh, approximately how many square feet are you estimating? And then secondly, one of the issues that came up a year and a half ago when we had the fire alarm that cleared out this, what, this uh, uh, room, it actually cleared out the whole building and everybody had to go out in the cold into the, the turnaround. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that was, was, there was uh, talk afoot about taking that, glass, uh, that grassy area and turning that into a handicapped parking spot because yeah. the way it's uh, being done now mm -hmm. is a fire hazard. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the fire hazard, but, but that's precisely what I was referring to. We would want to, as part of this plan, if we were to move forward, address that. Put more um, limited mobility, handicap uh, parking spots out there, as well as just other parking spots out there, so you'd have close access to the building, um, and we'd have a loading dock, which would come right in the back of the chapel or the student center, um, and we'd have access for not just worshiping attenders, but also clients that come for all, all manner of things throughout the week. Um, you know, this, this east entrance isn't the greatest down those stairs like that, that, that we have there, so I, I agree. As far as square footage, that's part of the research being done right now. We would want to triple or more this, this, the capacity of Shepherd's Heart and get storage where it's, uh, it's not, you know, on a whole separate part of this building where it is right now. So, uh, but I, I don't know the exact number. We're still working on that. Yeah. Other questions? He's coming right behind you. Just so everybody else can hear. Thanks, Galen. So I want to switch a little bit yeah. and say there's a tremendous amount going on. I have yeah. deep respect for everything that seems to be happening and has happened. Uh, my question relates to you and the staff. 
um, how are you going about making sure that you have enough rest mm. and recharge time and addressing the needs of the staff, both personally and spiritually and, and professionally? Probably should ask my wife who's sitting back there about that. <laughs> It's a good question. John, you want to speak to that? Yeah. <laughs> Quite frankly, it is part of why we hired John. I, um, I've got uh, a little bit of energy. I get excited about things. But I, I could see that, that this is not sustainable for me. And um, so part of, a big part of the reason, it's not just about me. I don't mean that. But I mean for us, for our staff, for you, uh, it's a big part of uh, why we hired John. So that's, that's not the end all be all answer, but that's part of it. You want to speak to that anything more? Yeah, I think, I think uh, Jeff's job is to uh, have a vision and to push the staff. And part of me coming on is to help make sure that we are sustainable in terms of our pacing um, and that, uh, that our staff are having, have good self-care practices. So that's going to be a big part of this next year is me uh, just evaluating that and stepping into that. And uh, that will be a big part of what I want to do. I want to pastor our pastors. You know, um, the rate of change, Galen, on that note, so Clark's got a question, but I'll finish answering. Um, the, I asked our staff, uh, ministry department has, I don't remember, several months ago, to um, talk about how they respond to change. I gave them four categories. Do you, when, you, when, when change comes, do you rejoice about change? Yes, change. Do you um, what's the, resign yourself, like, or, or resolve, like, okay, I, I, this is hard for me, but I'm going to resolve to get on board? Are you resigned to it, like, it's inevitable, can't do anything about it, just, you know, or do you resist? I'm in the rejoice category. I like change. I get uh, antsy. We don't have change. So part of the staff's job and John and Abe's job is to go, slow down, Jeff, you know, um, because it needs to be, they need to line up. Um, but... I, I think one of the, in our, in our discussion out of that conversation with the staff, it was evident that, you know, that part of um, good ideas, the right ideas in the wrong time, forced through in the wrong way, can really do damage to a church staff, to a church community, to the, to the mission of God in that place. I don't want to do that. So I, it's a wise question you're asking. I, I'm trying to pay attention to that. On the other hand, I also think that God's given us a wave of momentum and grace and blessing. We see it financially. We see it in attendance. We see it in so many other activities. We have to steward that well as also. And it would be irresponsible for us just to say, well, let's just rest and kind of coast now. Because I think the inertia for us as a church is not toward greater impact and greater risk. It's toward comfort, security, sleepy little suburban church. We got our three campuses. Let's just well enough sit alone, right? I think God's given us an opportunity to do something significant for the kingdom, and we should steward that well also. But and, and, and let me speak to it just a little bit from the executive council's perspective, because we are all about uh, Jeff and his health and his development. A couple of things we've asked of Jeff specifically is that he participate in the cohort, which he does, which helps him get fed spiritually through other pastors and get experiences from other pastors. And then the other big one is we do like him to go on a mission trip once a year. We want him to have that world perspective and that uh, close proximity to what's going on with our missionaries and what's going on in the mission world. Uh, and of course he has a number of accountability groups and, and one of those is actually sponsored by the executive council. So we're very much aware of that issue for Jeff as well as it is for the staff and, and have taken some steps we believe help feed into that. You know what the cohort does for me? I hear about how messed up those guys' churches are, and I think, wow, we're doing great. It's, hell, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> no, only kidding. <laughs> yes, Clark, Clark, and then in the back. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Who's next, Dave? You tell me. I've been around a while, but I'm curious. Uh, with our growth and the size that we become, uh, we first came here in 1972 and wow. left because it was too small. And we really? Went to, we went to that big church called Wheaton Bible Church <laughs> for about 30 years. Um, wow. But we're here, so if you don't like me, you got trouble. Um, <laughs> but all kidding aside, um, there are a lot of people sitting right here right now, and people in my age group and my grandchildren call me an old man. Uh, but seriously, the older people who have time um, are willing to volunteer. And my question is, do you get sufficient volunteer, and do you, to the new executive pastor, seek out and offer opportunities for volunteerism? It makes for great teamwork. 
obviously, yeah. when we are part of the process? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked it. For those of you that have time and are looking for a place to volunteer, get on your phone as you leave this meeting and call Becky Chenault. And call Jimmy Valentini. Call Laura Terrell. And tell them, I got time. Because the places where we can use some, some help is in our is Chapel Street Kids and in special needs and in groups. We want to grow those things and they're, 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 some of them are at capacity. Um, but the second part of your question, do we reach out and ask and make those needs known? That's a challenge at times to make all the, because sometimes all the things, you should see the list of things we have to communicate in a week. It's just noise after a while. What's to communicate, what's the greater need at what time? Um, I, I take your point, that's a good thing to do. Um, I, I don't know, we, did, we still did a survey a while back on the percentage of people of Chapel Streeters, then First Baptist, that were serving. And it was healthy, but we could grow in that area. Um, we, we track um, new connections, new people connected to the church, and new people engaged in service. And that number has been growing year after year after year. But to this specific demographic, you might think that you're, if, you're, if you think you're too old to make an impact in Chapel Street kids, you're wrong. They would love you. You'd be a spiritual grandmother or grandfather to some of those kids over there, and they would love you, and we could use you. So anything else to say to that, John? So, so all the other staff members will be. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Clark. So um, a lot of good things, and I'm really, my heart's really stirred about all the good things going on, and just thank you and your team for sharing today all of that. A couple of shout-outs and then a question. First, to Aaron Wise. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you said it's more than the food pantry, but I'd like to circle back to that and say the food pantry actually opens other opportunities. That's right. And bringing bags of food helps people get off off of where they are and onto something else that we can help yeah. them do. That's well and said. And then begin serving. That's well said. As well. So, shout out to Aaron. And then um, we were actually able to help last night at the uh, S'mores and More. And a shout out to Becky. I, yeah. I don't know. I was thinking back. She's probably home asleep right now. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. I was thinking about her actually being burned out because I think she's been going since before uh, VBS hard yeah. at that and opening the, the, the programs in the fall and yeah. um, the, week, the weekday program yeah. and that last night. So yeah. it was a really good time last night. Well attended, I thought. Hey, can I just tag on there before you ask sure. your question? Because Becky did a phenomenal job. And I also want to say to Jenny Caterer, who's here somewhere, to Laura Taro, to Jen Gomel, uh, to a number of other people who made that happen. It wasn't, I mean, Becky was a spearhead for sure, but it was, she was not alone. We had a lot yeah. of our staff members doing a lot of heavy lifting. Right. So my question is about the legacy programming that you're starting. You're having meetings about that, and I know you're going to share material yeah. for those that attend those. But I think as a church, we probably should know, even those of us that don't participate in one way or the other, is there a charter for that in terms of where the money's going to go mm -hmm. and how it's going to be invested? This, this falls under the purview of Pastor Brian's specific role in the transition plan of development. In this, in so about, but Ken is on the board for that. I'll let him speak to it. Yeah, so, so there is a charter for that um, fund. And uh, it, it covers not only the purpose of the fund, but how it's organized, how it's administered. There's an independent board that actually will have oversight over that fund. I am on, a, on that board along with a number of others. Um, and so it will be handled very much in the same spirit with all the same governance of, of a uh, normal, what you'd consider to be uh, those types of funds, um, endowment type fund. So if you want to get a copy of that charter though, just you know, send me an email, Ken, O'Brien or K. O'Brien at Chapel Street, and I'll make sure we get that information to you, and then yeah. for anybody. Can you speak at a high level what, what the funding will be used? Yeah, good. Uh, primarily, the funding is, is not intended for daily operations, those kinds of things. It's more funded for those large type expenditures that we couldn't necessarily achieve with, um, say, Serve the World as, as a fund, where it's very large expenditures, whether that's facilities expansion, not only our own facilities, but even if we were looking at a global mission or global opportunity to serve that required a significant amount of funds for, and again, you start, you think of that in the context of yeah. maybe a facilities expansion or some other type of major need that might occur somewhere. Um, so that's really, the design is more for those larger type expenditures and not so much for operations. Yeah, the, the vision as I understand, I've talked with Brian and Ken and Doug about this, is that those kinds of, not the general fund of our operations, and Serve the World already exists, 
But those kinds of things that come up where a church typically would have to do a capital funds campaign to make any kind of impact, that maybe this would, over time, grow to be a resource where we could respond to opportunities and needs for the gospel on larger scale than we can right now. So, uh, both pres- locally and globally. But they wouldn't be things that I, I mean, as Ken said, the board would be making those decisions. So the, the fund it would not be something, it's not, it's not uh, Pastor Jeff's like fund to fund his initiative. That's not at all the case. I, wouldn't, I don't have any say over where that goes. Um, anyway, it's important to say that, I think. Yeah, thank you. Good. Any other questions before we call it a meeting? I, I really mean, I mean this. Thank you for showing up and asking questions. I love our church. I love what God's doing here. I love his church in general, but I love our church. I love what God's doing here. I'm excited about the future. I want to see uh, where he takes this. Not, none of us envisioned this, you know, five years ago. And so I get, I get excited about what that will mean five years from now. I want to do that wisely. Um, and so th- don't be surprised if we have these meetings periodically. It doesn't mean there's a problem. It means let's just talk about what we think is happening, where God's taking us. And we invite those conversations and questions. So thank you for asking them. So let me echo Jeff's thank you for the questions, for your participation. I love hearing the types of questions that you're asking, whether it's replication of programs or what's the culture, location, those kinds of things. Guess all the stuff that we're wrestling with right now. Um, and I especially pre- appreciate what Jeff said about this season of where we are. You know, a season ago, we were expanding. We were doing Mill Creek. Now we're in a season of preparing, making sure that we're looking to the inside, that we have the systems, we have the structure, we have the personnel and the staff to take us forward. But soon we will be moving into that next season, that next season of expansion. And this is the time for us to start thinking about that, to get your input, to start thinking about all those questions, whether it's 10 miles, whether it's north, south, east, west, whether we replicate programs, how do we make sure we have a staff prepared, etc. These are all the things that we're wrestling with right now. And I, I'm even more excited about thinking about what is it that's five years down the road? When we think about that campus that's 20 miles away, 30 miles away, because we've extended that far. Yes, at that point, we will have to start duplicating ministry just because of the sheer proximity issue. Those are great challenges that I'm looking forward to, to answering and addressing in those years to come. But this is the type of input we need. This is the type of participation we need from the church body to make that happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for participating. And the next time we have a meeting, tell your friends. This is where you get all the good information. I'm going to close this in prayer. And again, just want you to have a wonderful afternoon. Appreciate all that you're doing here at the church. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. And thank you for the hearts um, that just want to strive after you. And what a difference that makes in this church and for just the the caring and the participation, the people want to just do and serve you. We just thank you for that so much and thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for today, for the input. We ask that you be with everyone as they move along their way and just uh, help us to continue to be mindful of your will, your uh, desire for us in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.